Hello everyone and welcome back. We already have started our journey of learning about the top down parsers. In this session, we are going to learn about the LL1 parsers. So, without any further ado, let's get to learning. Coming to the outcome of today's session, today, at first, we will observe the organization of LL1 parser. And thereafter, we will acquire the understanding of the concepts of first and follow functions. Now, we already have seen during the classification of parsers that the top down parsers without backtracking are mainly of two types. One is recursive descent parsers, and the other one is predictive parsers. Now, in the previous session, we learned about the recursive descent parsers, didn't we? However, we didn't really go through why it is named like recursive descent parsers. I mean, yes, we have seen how it works. Basically, all the non terminals are converted into respective functions, and how the entire parse tree is being created. We already have witnessed that. Yet again, we don't really know why it is named like this. Let me clear that out for you. So, basically, this was our code for our recursive descent parser, if you remember. This is the main function. This is the match function, which helps us with the terminal symbols. This is the function e, which mirrors the start symbol of the grammar. And this one here is the function e prime or e dash, which happens to be a mirror image of this non terminal e dash. Now, when this particular code is placed into the primary memory for execution, it doesn't really remain a code anymore, that means a program anymore. Now, this one is a C program, isn't it? So, in the memory, when it becomes the process, it will have the memory layout as this one. Now, the detailed concept of the memory layout of C programs has been taught beautifully in C programming course. So, I recommend you all to go through the C programming important question set 3 for the detailed study of that. Now, in this particular session, we are going to use only the things which will be useful for this course of compiler design. However, if we briefly discuss the segments, this is the text or code segment where the code actually resides. Now, coming to the next one, here the initialized data, that is the initialized variables are kept. Now, on top of that, we have the segment for the uninitialized data, which is also called the BSS. Now, coming to this segment, this is an interesting one. Here we have both the things, the stack and the heap. Now the stack grows downwards, whereas the heap, it grows upwards. Now for the better understanding of recursive descent parser, we actually need this stack. Because this particular stack is used while the execution of the entire program code. Now logically speaking, the working principle of a stack can be better illustrated with a structure like this one. So we are going to use this one. Now, at this particular line, we already have started the execution of main. So, when the execution of main starts, in the stack, the activation record of the function main is kept. Now, we are going through the main function and eventually, when we hit the line number 3, we get to call the function e. Now, the calling of the function e signifies the construct of the non-terminal e, that is the start symbol in the parse tree. Meanwhile, in the stack, on top of the activation record of the main function, the activation record of the function e will be kept. Now, in the main function, once the execution of the function e is done, the control is going to return at the line number 4, isn't it? So, in the activation record of main, the operating system will store the line number 4, which will be at the anchor point for the function main. Now, let's begin the execution of e. So, we are in line number 1 in the function e. Eventually, we get to the line number 2, 3, 4, and finally at 5, we get to call the function match i. Now, when match i is called, in the stack, on top of the activation record of the function e, the activation record of match i will be placed now. And the successful execution of which will signify the parsing of this particular terminal symbol i in the parse tree. Now, after the execution of match is done, in the function e, we are going to return to the line number 6. Therefore, in the activation record of e, the operating system is going to store the line number 6 as the anchor point. Now, say the match i has successfully executed and we have returned to the function e's line number 6. Here, we are going to call the function e dash, aren't we? When the function e dash is called, by that time, 
the match i has also been executed so the operating system is going to pop this activation record and in place of this one the activation record of the function e dash will be kept which if executed successfully will ensure the derivation of the non terminal e dash in the parse tree now before the execution of the function e dash starts the operating system will notice that the function e will return in the line number 7 after the successful execution of the function e dash isn't so therefore in the activation record of e it will update the anchor point as line number 7 now and this way the execution will follow now this stack right here is called the recursion stack and it is indeed a top down parser and in case of top down parser from the start symbol we basically descend in order to generate the parse tree for the input stream and that's the reason why it is called recursive descent parser remember we are using a recursion stack and due to top down parsing we are basically descending hence the name recursive descent parser now in this session we are going to start learning about the predictive parsers that is ll1 parsers now coming to ll1 parsers For the construction of the LL1 parser, we will need a few components. First, we will need an input buffer, basically where we will store the input. Now, if you remember, the inputs are always kept with the dollar symbol by the end. So let's place the dollar symbol in here for better significance. Now, from the input buffer, the LL1 parser will receive the inputs naturally. Now for the construction of the parse tree l1 parser will need something called an l1 parsing table and once this has been created after that the l1 parser will use the elements from this one during the construction of the parse tree now alongside the input buffer and the l1 parsing table the l1 parser will also need the stack and the bottom of the stack will be denoted by the dollar symbol so this is the organization of the l1 parser Now since we have already seen it let's move on to the name of the ll1 parser now the first l in ll1 parser stands for scan from left to right try to understand this this is the input buffer and here the strings will be kept while we proceed with the ll1 parsing the input streams will be scanned from left to right so this l signifies that left to right of the scanning coming to the next l I hope you all remember that it is a top down parser and all the top down parser uses top down approaches and top down approach uses leftmost derivation hence the next l signifies the use of leftmost derivation now coming to the one in here it specifies one look ahead symbol now if you remember ll1 parser is a type of predictive parser focus on the name predictive Basically the LL1 parser will generate the parse tree taking decisions from the LL1 parsing table based on one look ahead symbol from the input buffer in every iteration so this is how the LL1 parser gets its name now before we learn about the LL1 parsing method we need to learn how to construct this LL1 parsing table and in order to construct LL1 parsing table we need to learn about two different concepts coming to the first one there is the first function now what is first given any non terminal of a cfg that is a context free grammar if we derive all the possible strings from it the first terminal or terminals is the first of the non terminal let me explain with an example see this is a context free grammar s can be rewritten as small a capital a capital b followed by capital c now let's try to find out the first of s now from this particular production rule from s we can derive this a followed by capital a capital b capital c now this is the only string which can be derived from s according to this particular grammar however the first terminal in this particular string is this small a so the first of s is going to be the small a now observe given any non terminal of a cfg there is this non terminal if we derive all possible strings from it unfortunately this is the only string which can be derived from here anyway this will stand for now the first terminal 
is the first of the non terminal so this is the first terminal therefore this is going to be the first of this non terminal how about we find out the first of a let's do that now from a we can only derive the terminal symbol b so this is going to be the first of a what will be the first of b now from b we can derive c following this production rule b can be rewritten as small c therefore this is the terminal which is going to be the first of this non terminal b now we are only left with c and c can be rewritten as d so the first of c that is c can only derive d and hence it will be d only interesting isn't it let's go through another example shall we consider this grammar let's find out the first of s now considering this production rule from s we can derive a b c now these are all non terminals in case of first we need the first terminals now coming to this string this is the first non terminal and using this production rule that is a can be rewritten as a from a we can derive a so if we derive it like this in that case from a the first terminal that we get is small a so in first of s small a will be there now there is another production rule involving the capital a that is a can be rewritten as epsilon so if a derives epsilon this will signify that we haven't derived any terminal symbol yet so now we have to consider b now from b we can derive small b following this production rule b can be rewritten as small b therefore if a derives epsilon in that case for s the first terminal that we will derive is b therefore in first of s b will also be there so these two terminals will be included in the first of s now observe we already mentioned it can be a terminal or a set of terminals didn't we so this is the concept of first let's move on to the next one that is follow now follow is during the process of derivation the terminals that could follow the non terminal are to be considered as follow of the non terminal basically all the terminals which will follow the non terminal will fall under the follow set of that particular non terminal let me illustrate this with an example observe this grammar here the start symbol is s now if we talk about the follow of s apparently s is not being followed by anything however if you remember the derivation will always start from the start symbol s itself and both in the input buffer and in the stack which will be followed by the dollar symbol so basically the start symbol is always followed by the dollar symbol itself so in the follow of s that is the start symbol we will at least have the dollar symbol now from the start symbol s we can derive a b and c using this production rule can't we let's now find out the follow of a now observe the non terminal a is followed by b c these two are also non terminals but in the set of follow we need terminals now coming to b it can derive b that is the small b so basically during the process of derivation the non terminal a is actually followed by the terminal symbol b now apparently there is another production rule involving the capital b non terminal that is b can be rewritten as epsilon so in case b derives epsilon in that case we don't have any terminal yet which will follow a so we need to consider c now now c can derive small c using this production rule c can be rewritten as small c so in case b derives epsilon in that case the non terminal a is being followed by the terminal symbol small c therefore in follow of a we will have the terminals b and c let's now find out the follow of b observe b is being followed by the terminal symbol c hence the follow of b will have the terminal c now what about the follow of c although it may look like c is being followed by nothing but if you remember s was being followed by the dollar symbol and while s got replaced by this string abc c became the rightmost symbol which should also be followed by the dollar symbol therefore the follow of c will have the dollar symbol so basically during the process of derivation the terminal or terminals 
that could follow the non-terminal are to be considered as follow of that particular non-terminal, which in case of S, here it is the dollar symbol. For A, there are two terminal symbols B and C which follows the non-terminal A. Coming to B, we have the terminal symbol C and finally for capital C, we also have the dollar symbol. Do remember, in both the cases of first and follow functions, we are actually looking for the terminals. And another thing to note, in follow, we never include epsilon. So, in this session, we first observe the organization of LL1 parser. Thereafter, we acquire the understanding of the concepts of first and follow. Alright people, that will be all for this session. In the next session, we will learn about the first and follow in details. So, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.